the agenda. Okay, over to me. Hi, uh, so as Aaron said, I'm a bit of a bumblebee obsessive. Um, so I was supposed to uh, give Debbie, who's on the call, I think, a hand with uh, this project for my master's project, but because of the, uh, the current coronavirus situation, wasn't able to go out in the field to do the, the field work for, for this. So um, I just wanted to keep being involved. So I wrote up the report for this, which I'm sure we can send out the link for anybody that would be interested in having a read and getting a bit more background on bumblebees in general and the Bilberry bumblebee. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you a bit about what we've done on the project and why, why this bumblebee needs conserving. So it's just a quick um, layout, just so you know where we are. Um, so get an introduction to bumblebees, just for just so everyone's on the same same level for their importance and bits, and then a background on the bilberry bumblebee and how this has led on to the project uh, coming about with the National Trust. And then I'll have a little uh, quick identification quiz, which is no worries because I uh, I have got them wrong in uh, previously, so don't worry if it, if it's uh, not quite going to plan. And then we have a little little bit about the next steps for this year onwards for the project and bumblebee conservation in general. So I was just interested to know kind of what you, what your experience level is with bees or bumblebees in general. So do you want to put, I don't know how to do the first poll. If you just put that up, just interesting to see if it's, if it's basic or beginner and just interested in the natural world intermediate or you know a bit more about them and just remember guys all these polls are completely anonymous so yes. we, we don't know who's saying no judging yeah, no judging at all. <laughs> that look like it's slowed down with answering i think Okay, so reasonably well split across a few more um, intermediate ones. Who's that one? Okay, so that's good to know just for where I want to talk to you about. I think my <laughs> screen has just stopped working. Oh, there we go. Okay, um, so just an introduction to bumblebees for those of you that just need a little refresher. So this quote on the top here, which is just about um, why bees are important in general, but obviously this includes the bumblebees, which we have 24 species in the UK, as well as the many so solitary bees, which I'm sure they'll have a, another FSC talk that will cover this, but I'm gonna focus on the bumblebees for this talk because there's so much to cover, cover otherwise. So this is a general, diagram of just the bumblebee just so you can see the different sections of it um, and basically they're they're the quite distinctive large hairy and usually striped pollinating bees that will fly around and you get the you get the buzzing noise associated with them if that that if anyone is unsure that's that's what they tend to appear like and they have a quite a diverse range of nesting behaviors so we do have um one that's arboreal, which is the tree bumblebee, but the rest tend to be uh, at ground level. So you get carder bumblebees, which will, um, as you know, with with wool in the, when they were um, felting, they will card the moss and dead vegetation to, into like a protective structure. Um, and then others will nest in the ground. So they might use uh, abandoned small mammal nests or or something like that just because they can't dig actually into the ground as easily. And then with bees, they're like ants and wasps. So they are the social, social animals mostly, although there are a couple of ex exceptions, which I'll cover in a second. Um, so for bumblebees, the true social ones, you have different castes dividing into sex and their behavior or roles. So firstly, you have majority of them are the female workers which are sterile so they don't contribute anything for reproduction but they are just they'll be the main main ones that you see in peak bumblebee season that are out foraging and looking after the nest 
and then you have female queens which there's just normally one per nest but occasionally they do get get competitive and take over each other's nests so you might there might be one or two in there but there's normally one one top dog as it were which is fertile and then she will just lay all of the eggs for that nest um and then it'll be sort of all of her offspring that are flying around and then you have the males which again are just reproductive um and they will tend to feed on nectar whereas the workers and queens will go around collecting nectar and pollen but the pollen is just to feed the um the offspring whilst they're in their larval form okay um so i'll just go on to the the um bilberry bumblebee which is obviously the, the main main bee that we'll be doing in this in this talk which is bombus monticola so the bombus latin is sort of translates to the buzzing noise that bumblebees make and then monticola as you might you might be able to guess is that they are an upland species so they're sort of buzzing uh, mountain dwellers i guess <laughs> um and just on the slides i've just shortened bilberry bumblebee to bb so that's just what that means in case it, in case it looked confusing um and also, it's quite an interesting note that um dave Goulson, when he set up his bumblebee conservation trust they actually used the used the bilberry bumblebee in the logo so you can see it just in the, the little circle picture in the in the top corner there so you can just see they're just beautiful bees <laughs> um so we have just to go over their identification quickly so we have the head section which is just highlighted from the sort of the front of their head to about where their eyes are which always has yellow hair and then males also have yellow facial hair which you can't really see in this in this diagram because it's more on, on the face of them rather than rather than looking like a moustache um, and then on the thorax, which is the, the first sort of large body section, it's got two yellow bands and then the central bit is black. And then the abdomen, and this is this is a key bit that separates them from the other red tailed bumblebees, is that it's mo more than half red. So the others will only have the very smallest amount of red on them or less than half red. So these are a couple of the confusion species and normally in gardens it will be the two that are outlined in orange so the early bumblebees and this is an example of the worker so you can see that it's got the pollen collection on its uh, on its leg there and then the red tail male also is quite a common garden occurrence um but the the red tail females are just red and black so if you see this yellow want to be in your garden it's likely to be the male red tail or an early bumblebee but we also have this um, red tail cuckoo which is in the middle um, and that has is a lot bigger it's got smokier wings and a lot a lot less hairy it's got sort of quite a boxy shaped head as well which is another confusion species but we also have um, red shanked carders which are a lot a lot less common so those are unlikely to be seen but those sort of look like a red tail, but they have instead of black black hairs on their legs, they have um, red hairs. So you sort of need to get a good look at that, but unlikely to see those ones. This is just um, just to go over bumblebee ecology, just a bit more generally, and then focusing back onto bilberry bumblebee, is they always have an annual life cycle with the three casts that I mentioned. So that was the the queens, the workers, and the males. Um, so this this life cycle diagram here, which I've just produced, is just showing the overall cycle for basically all the bumblebees. There's a couple of species that um, in in the south of Europe, and possibly they might start doing this with climate change, that will have two generations a year. But generally, it's just one. So they'll have the overwintered queens will emerge in depends on the species, but normally early spring springtime will produce their first workers which will then look after the offspring and forage for the nest so once the queen's got enough workers she won't leave the nest for the rest of the season and then a bit later into the summer they'll start producing the new reproductive males and queens and then once these have developed to adulthood those will leave the nest and mate with males or queens from 
surrounding nests so that they're not having inbreeding issues. And then these males will die off once they've mated and the new queens will overwinter. So sort of like hibernation for bees. And this is normally just in, sometimes you might find the more common bumblebees hibernating in like your plant pots or just where there's, where there's a suitable space for them to stay. So just bringing it back to the bilberry bumblebee, the um, rough months on, on here in the blue text, that's about the time that they will start emerging and starting different parts of their life cycle. So they are definitely an upland specialist and like dwarf, dwarf shrub heathland. So this nearly consists of heather and bilberry mosaics. And as interesting is that there must be bilberry there. If it's exclusively heather, they won't, they won't visit it. And they also need some flower rich grasslands nearby to visit if they've got a, if there's less common flowering at certain times of year. And um, as I said earlier, some of the bumblebees and bilberry bumblebees will nest in the abandoned mammal nests. And this tends to be, they tend to be quite well hidden. I've got a picture um, on the next slide or the one afterwards um, showing how, how well hidden and camouflaged they are, but it's normally very dense vegetation and then near or either on or in, in the edge of moorland habitats. These are some just some general habitat pictures of where bilberry bumblebees have been found and where you might be able to keep an eye out for them if you're anywhere suitable for their presence. So the first is this wildflower pasture, which is, um, that's Stephen Falk's photo, but that was in the Stiper Stones, which is very local to the Long Mind. And the other two pictures are on, on the Long Mind from Debbie. Um, so the wildflower pasture is particularly important during the hungry gap in the summer where you've got a gap between the bilberry and the heather or any other flowering plant, flowering plants being flowered. So um, obviously upland teeth can be quite tannically poor in, in certain parts of the summer. So they will come off where they're nesting, come and visit to forage on the wildflowers in the pasture or the hay meadows or wherever it is, or a garden, and then fall back to their nests and come out again. So the wet flush is especially important, the second, the middle picture. If it's been particularly dry summer, obviously that will dry out last. So it will have any flowering plants available for longer for the bees to forage on. And that will go for any other, any other pollinators that feed on those type of plants. And then this is just an example of the bilberry heather, heather mosaic that they need. So obviously they will forage on bilberry when it's there or almost exclusively. So very specialist on that. Um, but you also need this heather mosaic. So the nests tend to be at the bottom of these dense vegetation stands. So they're quite well hidden. So this is a picture of, of a nest here just you can kind of see how small it is relative to Stephen's finger there. Um, and it's just very well hidden in, in dense vegetation. So you're, they're quite tricky to find and you'd be very lucky, lucky to see a nest. But some, sometimes if you keep an eye out for, and this goes for other bumblebees as well, if they seem to just be flying into just what looks like a big pile of vegetation and not coming out somewhere else that's likely to be a nest but if you sit there for 20 minutes or half an hour and you can see some ne nest traffic coming in and out that's usually a good indicator that there might be a nest there because otherwise I don't think there would be an underground plant <laughs> that would be attracting all of them. So um, as I just said they tend to favour bilberry if it's present but they are quite generalist foragers although there's a couple of clear preferences. So um, this picture is the bilberry, um, bilberry flower. As you can see, they're kind of, they're effectively like native blueberries. So it's very similar flower if you know what those look like, but because they hang down, sometimes the bilberry bumblebees are a bit more tricky to see. And this, and they grow quite in quite dense vegetation. We also have um, clovers and these bumblebees also go for 
things in the legume family, which includes birds, fit trefoils and clovers a lot of the time. And then brambles also are, are good for them too. But um, there are a couple of pictures in, in, in this presentation with a mumblebee. This is a red tail because you can see that it's just got the, the half red and then the rest is black on the abdomen. So they're not, they're not always um, bilberry bumblebees in the pictures, just, just so you, it doesn't get confusing. Um, so David Williams, I think in a couple of years ago, did a, did a report on all of the plants that the bilberry bumblebees were using at the Longmend. And so this is just a summary of the key ones that they were using. But in, in my report, I've got a massive long list that you'd be welcome to have a look and read a read of. But that's, it tends to be in very similar families. So they like the, the heathland plants and anything that's more wild flowery that you might get in a more meadow setting. And then this, this varies with, with the season. So when the queens are first out, if there's no bilberry out, they will use um, willow trees as, as your other queen bumblebees might do. And then they will use different, different plants through the season. And then obviously that changes when you get the, the males and new queens coming out, we'll also use different things. You have the important second bilberry flowering occasionally. I don't think it's every year, but I can, I can check that if anybody is, wants to find out more. But every couple of years you get a, a second flowering of the bilberry. So that's really important for the next generation of these bumblebees. And I imagine that you might get a peak in abundance for the ne next year. So that, that's, that's very helpful. If you manage to notice that, you might, might have more of a chance of seeing the bilberry bumblebee if you couldn't see one the previous year. So just bring, bring it back round to why, why, we, why we came up with this project and why they need con conserving. So this little red pinpoint is about the area that the long mend and stipe stones are around. So you can see that's like quite a small area and currently they now are restricted to localized hotspots, which are sort of above 300 meters above sea level. They've got that um, upland heath type habitat mixed with the wildflower, wildflower meadows. Um, so some, some other hotspots at the Peak District, where there's currently a project being run by Bumblebee Conservation Trust to look at bilberry bumblebees. Um, in North Wales and the Cairngorms, as you can imagine, because those, those are much higher altitude and probably a lot less disturbed than some of the other areas. And there's been a recent colonization in Ireland, but you can see that in the Southeast, there is, there's nothing. <laughs> so, because this is not upland, Heath, you don't get it in this corner of the country. So some of the main reasons that they need conserving is often habitat loss. So the same for pretty much all of the other bumblebee species in the UK and probably globally. They're all losing their habitat or it's getting fragmented by um, agriculture, which obviously includes the, uh, the pesticide word, but also intensive farming as you're going to not need the wild, wild meadows, wildflower meadows as much. So these might have been transformed into um, croplands or just um, ploughed fallow for a year. So that reduces any um, potential nesting habitat and foraging, foraging areas for the bees. Climate change as well is a big one because they are montane or upland species. So they, they require a bit cooler temperatures. And they're also, if it's warming up, you're gonna get different emergence times. So they may well get a mismatch between when the queens or workers are out and when the, their main food source of the bilberry starts flowering, um, which might mean that they need to move um, uphill or to more northerly distributions, which unfortunately, if it, if it keeps going at the rate it's going, then they're eventually going to run out of room in the UK and then they will become extinct in the UK. But hopefully this project can help uh, stop that. We also have some more, more small scale 
factors, which is the heather beetle and this Phytophthora fungus. So the heather beetle, obviously from the name, attacks heather. So this strips it and kills the heather plants when they have, um, every couple of years, plague population sizes. And then the fungus is attacks bilberry, but you might recognize the name because it's got quite a wide range of hosts. So it is one that can attack some types of garden plants. And then heath management, but the key is if it's overmanaged, because there's been a couple of studies recently that if you manage it at a suitable threshold, then you can actually induce flowering of the plants. And they've, they've found that there are some bumblebees which will effectively bite the leaves of a plant to induce flowers. So the plant uses it as a last ditch attempt to reproduce and keep its population going. But obviously if that's overgrazed, then you're just gonna lose the plant completely and then there'll be nothing for the insects to feed on. And then very, a minor one, but these are important in their own right, that nest parasites such as the forest cuckoo bees for bilberry bumblebee will obviously, they'll overtake their host nest. So then you won't, you won't get a queen coming out of that. You'll just get lots of the cuckoo bumblebees. So they are sort of not true so social, social bees. So that they're effectively like a cuckoo bird. So they will overtake the, the nest of another bumblebee and just pump out their own eggs. And the original workers will look after, look after those because they, they don't know any different. So just bring that background to a project background. So I mentioned earlier that there's a Bumblebee Conservation Trust project called Pollinating the Peak, which is based in the Peak District, just generally around educating people about bumblebees and pollination, but with a specific aim to secure the future of bilberry bumblebees, which is sort of linked to the overall aims of the Bumblebees on the Mint project. So obviously this uh, started because um, Debbie found, found a bilberry bumblebee um, in, I think it was July 2019. Um, obviously we have got historic records there, but that really kicked it off. Um, and she <laughs> marched down to the National Trust um, office and, and they were very happy to take on the project. So that, that's all worked, worked out quite well. Um, so we've got say historic, historic records at the Long Mint, but also these four areas that are quite local, local to it. So we had the main aims of raising awareness of bumblebees and particularly the bilberry bumblebee interruption. Um, having a look and trying to work out what the baseline distribution of this species is on the Long Mint. Working out where they might visit during the hungry gap and what they would forage on. And then from this, hopefully proposing a standard method for monitoring bilberry bumblebees. So I have split the next couple of slides into how we achieved or how we, how we worked on these aims. So it should become a bit clearer what, what the um, evaluation of the project actually came out as. So for the raise awareness, I've just sort of got, grabbed a load of pictures and then it's, it's like a nice little mind map of everything that's gone on. So the first awareness event was this, a world full of bumblebees here, which was the launch event um, right at the start of the project where we got Jill Perkins to come down and talk to prospective volunteers about bumblebees and their conservation. And we just managed to squeeze this in as one of the last uh, in-person meetings before the first lockdown. So that was really that was really good to meet some volunteers, answer questions, work out what interest levels are like. And then of course we have this talk going on. So hopefully you can talk to talk to friends that might be interested and um, have a look for, for bilberry bumblebees or any bumblebees in your garden and your local walk areas. Um, and then this also popped up on the one of the FSC B courses, which I don't know how many how many people have done that, but that was um, that was a, a great way to advertise maybe some one of the less known bumblebee species. And we also had a couple of ways to get people talking about them. So if they'd seen seen a bilberry bumblebee or 
just fancied the little pin badge, you can buy buy those off Bumblebee Conservation Trust. And those might just kickstart some some conversations. Same as this um this mask down here. It's got the Bilberry Bumblebees on, so you can still have a chat without infecting anybody. And then due to the lockdown, I had to alter the project a little bit to be focused in the garden rather than on the long mint, which obviously you weren't able to travel to during the first lockdown. So that was good to get get people excited about when when you were allowed outside to look a bit more wide ranging areas. We had the baseline distribution, which um, I've just got some basic maps here, but there's a couple more on the next two slides, which show a bit more detail for habitat information. So we have this the first one on the left. These green, the green squares are historic, so pre-2020 data, which is limited to kilometer square records. So it's it's quite nice to see the, the black dots, which are the 2020 records, are uh, in some similar areas. So that that's that's great to show that the habitat management, which has been going on for I'm not sure how many years, has worked or at least is going in the right direction for these this species. But just, just with the caveat of it being historic data and just limited to kilometer square records, we don't from this map, it doesn't show the abundance in each square and how many years it's covering, but it's a good, good sort of baseline to kick off the project from and show that they're, they're present and important and worth conserving. And then the map on the right, is just shows that they are definitely Heathland specialists because all, all, of, all of the 2020 records, and if you also overlay onto this, this map, they are all in very similar areas within the Heathland. But one interesting point from the historic map is that actually they were they were coming into Church Stretton, which is, I don't know how much you know about the area, but this all of this is like little village residential areas. So they must be using gardens or well-planted areas previously around the Mind when there's less flowering on the heath, which is, that's a really good sign that they can, they can travel a bit further if needed to keep the populations going. Which brings me on to where are they going during these hungry gaps when there's not a lot of food available on the, on the heathland. So the first, following on from the Church Stretton records on the previous map, is the Bilberry Bumblebee in your garden project. So we had one, one record in this um, all Stretton area, which is interesting because it's right close to the um, wildflower meadows. So they seem to be traveling from, from the heathy purple areas over here to collect forage from some well-stocked gardens and the meadows, whilst there's not a lot of forage available on the heathland. And then the red circle, which has just popped up uh, oh, here, um, is called Jinlai Meadows, which is, again, particularly helpful during this hungry gap when the upland heaths are more botanically poor. So the National Trust acquired this, I believe, in 2014 to transform it from, from a less traditionally managed habitat into hay meadows. So they now have got some wonderful wildflowers growing, popping up there um, as it's a lot less disturbed and it's all been managed properly with hay cuts and things. And I'll, we'll send out a link because there's a video that explains the process of what they're doing a bit more in detail than I can tell you. So we'll send that out in a post event email, I think. And then we had 10 Bilberry Bumblebees actually that were visiting, that were visiting the meadows during this gap of forage time. And then the habitats that they were using were still majority heathland habitats with some bracken. And then of course they were using this, this grass and area during the times that there was less available on the heath. Uh, it's just 
just one thing to note on this map as well it was, it was really great to see that um they've, they've located a nest which unfortunately didn't survive through the season but there was also one queen spotted so that's a really good sign that they are using the long mint to um they've got a reproducing population there and they're not just visiting to forage and then going back to the, the other suitable area for nesting so that's an excellent sign and definitely worth continuing with managing the, the habitat suitably for them. So have what in these times do they tend to forage on? So in the meadows, because this is obviously wildflower, wildflower habitat, rather than the more heath and shrub, shrub type plants, they use a lot of this bird's foot trefoil and white clover. So um, these are both in the legume family, which again was one that I mentioned earlier that they particularly seem to be fond of. Um, and then on the long end, they actually managed to find 74 bilberry bumblebees overall, which is a, a fantastic amount for one season. And then because when they were foraging on the long end, that has tended to be when the bilberry was out. So that was really a major proportion of the diet, but they also used the clover and thistles a little bit too. So they, there's a, you can see the general preferences, but they are reasonably flexible depending on the uh, time of the year and season. So we then proposed a um, more standardized monitoring method for these bee species, because unlike the, the normal bee walk, um, which I can explain a bit more later if, if anybody's unsure of what, what exactly that is, is that for these bees, because their habitat is so specific and the different structure to the more varied, normal, if you will, um, habitats and the growth patterns of the, the vegetation density and the fact that bilberry flowers grow and hang, hang downwards, like sort of like a bell flower shape. The, the bees will just disappear in, into the vegetation. So you can't do a, do a walking transect and just note down what you see so easily. So um, we divided the long mend habitat into kilometer square grids, grid squares, and um, added a different levels of priority for how likely the species would be to be there for surveying. So for example, um, whether it would have included categories like how much bilberry is there, how much, how many wildflowers, um, if there were, if it was not uh, a high enough altitude, all of those sort of things that might affect, might affect it. And um, for these, we sort of followed a general transect using some sheep tracks, which was mostly to avoid damaging uh, birds' nests because obviously you've got to be aware that normally the time that everything comes out is also when birds and mammals are starting to emerge if they've hibernated. So, so you've got any ground nesting birds to watch out for. Um, but also that was important to follow the pre-made transects um, to prevent, to prevent um, the fungus being spread across the mint to different bilberry patches that might not already be affected and just to prevent damage of the vegetation generally so that it can keep regenerating and providing for all of the different wildlife that uses it. So this diagram just generally, and I'll cover this in a little bit more detail on the next slide, is just what, what the general pattern was for um, <coughs> surveying. So um, you sort of reached, reached your area that was where you were going to survey. Um, listen out for the, the bumblebee buzz, which I've got a recording of, hopefully, which should work. Um, and then you look out for, for the bumblebees that you can hear buzzing and hopefully follow them to record, photograph the location, which plants they're using, and then go, go from there. So this was the, the record recording form. 
so before before um, we, we started doing the bumblebee records, it's useful to have some non B data, which was including the date, start times, temperature, weather conditions, just because this can affect how much activity there might actually be on that particular day. So I've just circled the um, sunny option there because there was a significantly high proportion that were out on a sunny day and the weather was unusually sunny um, in the 2020 period, which we surveyed, surveyed in. So this also goes generally for other bumblebees. If you, if you fancy a walk around the garden or wherever you go normally for your, for your wonders, if, it's, if you're not seeing many and it's a quite a cloudy day, you can always go out and look for the bumblebees when it's a bit sunnier, you might have a bit more, a bit more luck. Um, so with, with the grid square surveys, you sort of wanted to use only a maximum of an hour because after that you, your attention might um, fade a little bit so you've been so zoned into, into listening and looking for very small things. So if, you if, you had, if they had a break between, that's fine, but normally your, your attention goes a bit after an hour. So then one, once you've filled all, all of the non-B data in, you can get to the uh, exciting, <laughs> exciting bit of the survey. So as I said before, you'd, you would listen for the bombus buzz, as it's called, um, and these vary in pitch. Now, the bilberry bumblebee is a sort of a small to medium sized bee. So the smallest bumblebee that, that we have is the early bumblebee, and this is quite closely related to bilberry bumblebees. So they have quite a similar, similar buzz pitch, um, which is quite high. So I'm just going to play this this uh, recording, and hopefully you can might be able to distinguish distinguish the buzz from the uh, the wind sound. <laughs> Hopefully that worked okay, but I can send it round after if um, people couldn't hear it. So once you've once you've located the buzz sound, um, you need to keep an eye out because these these bumblebees are, are relatively small, so they they do they're very active and will sort of dart inside the vegetation because of the bilberry bumble the bilberry flowers sorry uh, hanging down, so you can't see them sitting on top of flowers as easily as you might for other species. So if you see a fast, quite red bumblebee flying around, it might be one of these, in which case you might need to um, go on a bit of a, a chase, um, staying far enough back that you're not disturbing it. Um, and then once you've located it, ideally, you can take a photo of the bumblebee on the flower, or if you know what the flower is, that's also useful to note down. But because they're so speedy, a video is equally good and you can take a, you can take a screenshot, which will be fine for identification. And then once you've done this, you can note down the location of where, where this bumblebee was. And then uh, volunteers for this project just stuck around for another five minutes and just noted down if there were any other species and uh, how many how many there were in the area. Um, and then when, once you've finished that, that record set, you can move about 25 paces, which is about, about 10 meters, or until you hear the next um, buzzing noise and then repeat the B recording method. And if, if you were lucky enough to find a nest like they did last year, you would just note down the location and then do about 20 minutes of um, nest traffic observations. So that would be um, how many were coming in and out. And if you're able 
which directions they were coming from. But of course, you'd need to sit far enough back so that you're observing them, but the nest is not being disturbed. And I have just highlighted this in bright yellow because even zero records for a day are useful because there might be some something that you can't see at the time, whether it's just due to the weather or something else that's useful to know. So I just have the little identification quiz just coming up in the next couple of slides. So I just thought I'd give a, a quick reminder of the of the key features of the Bilberry bumblebees. So you might have a bit more of a chance of getting them, getting them right, because even I have got confused previously. So for the Bilberry bumblebees, obviously all of the casts look relatively similar. It's just the different size that can distinguish them a bit easier. So they've got these two, two yellow bands on the thorax and most of the abdomen is red. Okay. So um, do you want to put the question up? So it was just whether each of these pictures are bilberry bumblebees or not. Should I leave that one for now? Okay, so that was about 50-50. Um, so well done for everybody that said that it was. Um, and does, does anybody want to suggest why it might be a Bilberry Bumblebee or not? Otherwise I can explain, that's fine. Um, so this is very clearly got most of the abdomen it's got the red hairs on and you've got the two yellow bands so this this is a, a male bilberry bumblebee but you don't need to worry about um how how we know that okay um this is the next one so if you pop that question up again Remember, guys, this is completely anonymous, so we don't yes. know the same <laughs> There won't be any judging. <laughs> yeah, it is a lot harder than it seems, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's just, once you've got your eye in, it's okay, but it takes a little while to get it. Yeah. At the start of each season, I think. <laughs> Okay, so well done. Most people have put this is not. So this is the red tail male. So you can see quite clearly here, it's got a lot less red on the abdomen, which is the key feature to separate the red tail males from the bilberry bumblebees, because they both have the two yellow, yellow stripes. And likely is, unless you live um, at that altitude and you've got heathland around, it will likely be this red tail male or the early bumblebee species. Okay, okay so the next one is this or not? Okay, so this one uh, threw people a bit by the looks of it. So this is in fact a queen bilberry bumblebee. 
So you can see that it's got, except from this band here, that is all red. So that, that's quite a good clear image of how much of the abdomen actually is red. And the queens basically just look a bit longer than the rest of the females and males. And then again, they've got these the yellow bands on the face and uh, one here, which is just hidden by the um, wings at the moment. Okay, uh, next one. Okay, yep, so that that is not a bilberry bumblebee. Oh. Um, so that's the red tail cuckoo, and you can see it's got less red, less hair than the bilberry bumblebees, which in general, cuckoo bumblebees tend to look a bit shinier because they have less hair, a bit sparser, sparser haired. Um, they have got smokier wings, which is not so clear in this picture, but if you see one in your garden, it's quite an obvious feature. And they have quite a boxy head. So this is a female red red tail cuckoo, and the males can have um, yellow bands on, I believe. Okay, uh, I think it's just this one and one afterwards. So again, most people got that one. So this is another clear one. So this is a uh, worker bilberry bumblebee. So again, got a lot of red hair on the abdomen and then you've got the two yellow bands there. So that's a nice easy one too. And again, don't worry because they are tricky until you've got your eye in. Okay, I think this is the last, last little ID quiz. Okay, excellent. Yep, definitely not. It's only got the very smallest amount of red on the tip of the abdomen and the yellow bands are in slightly different places. So this is a worker early bumblebee, which is the other common bumblebee you might get in your garden with a red tail. Okay, um, so just just move on to um, what the project is going through for uh, this year and a bit more into the future of the project. So we've now moved more to two types of two types of projects. So we have the red tail project just to take take a bit more um, looking into detail at the other red tail species that we get on the mind and in the gardens around the Stepping Stones project area. So this obviously will include the bilberry bumblebee, but you can just go out in your garden or wherever you, you see a red tail bumblebee in, in the area and take a picture and send it off. No need to worry about identification, just send it to the, the email included on this, on this slide. Um, and then we would let you know which, which species that you've seen and then a bonus if you find the bilberry bumblebee, but it's nice to know what, what you've got flying around in your garden. So that would include the early bumblebee, the red tail cuckoo, and the red tail bumblebee. And depending on where you live, unlikely, but it might have the red shanked carder bee. And then the second level, which is a new one for this year, is to include the three carder bee extension. So this is 
for people that are a bit more experienced in the area of bumblebee identification, because we have found that there was between 2016 and 2020, there have been some recent records of the more rare bumblebee species. So that's just the brown banded carders and the moss carders, which yes, they're quite quite a rare species and they are they also are found in, I know one other hotspot for rare species that aren't specifically upland is the Dungeness Reserve in Kent. Um, so for these, it requires a bit more expertise for identification. So if anybody is um, a bit more experienced and has got training on how to net and pop bees for a bit more of a close up view of um, hair color or things like that, that would be interesting if you're able to help out to see how much how much of the carder population is is the common carder and if there if there's many or what the dis distribution of the the rarer carders are and then separate from that just within the the community we'd like to aim to establish some bee walks um, continue continuing with the garden monitoring and the long mend projects with the bilberry bumblebee but also including those two levels that are displayed on the slide there um, and coming off from those results show, which showed where the bilberry bumblebees were in their habitats we found if we focus on dry heaths then that would be a good start because due to the the lockdown we only were able to have a certain number of volunteers able to get out so to survey so if we focus on the areas of dry heath that um, look appears suitable from modeling then it might be useful to survey those to see if there's bilberry bumblebees there as well or if the distribution is a bit more limited to what we've already found um, and then also just for indication if you're looking for the forest cookie bee forest cookie bumblebee that is an indicator of where the bilberry bumblebees could be although they do um they do parasitize some other bumblebees so that's just just a note to be cautious that you might not have the bilberry bumblebee just because the forest cookie is there. And then, as I mentioned about the, the um, risks from over, over managing heath and, and habitats, there might be an effect from if you have sheep grazing, different um, livestocking rates. If you change that, there possibly might be beneficial for the next next future years of bilberry bumblebees if they've induced flowering so there's a bit more resources and then we'd also hope to contribute a bit with outreach with the bumblebee conservation project that was based in the peak district specifically looking at the bilberry bumblebees because they've been going for a few more years um, so if they've got a good base of volunteers and some good good knowledge which can extend a bit to a national national level to help with management and um, conservation in areas that might not have as much knowledge of bilberry bumblebees and bumblebees in general. And then this was just a slide that I just added in last minute because we, we've recently, within last couple of months, I think it was submitted a species recovery plan and it um, put in a bid for Green Recovery Challenge Fund to help manage the habitats around the Long Mind and the Stipus Tones for bilberry bumblebees. And obviously that will benefit any other invertebrates and other animals or plants that particularly have a preference for the upland habitat, because as you can see from this little um, table in the corner down here, although this bilberry bumblebee is least concern is actually decreasing on its trend. So it's an important thing to maybe not always look at the global trend because it might it will differ between local areas as it as it does with this um, the grayling because these are all I believe these are all species that are in the Shropshire Hills AONB and they're covered under this nature recovery plan. So this is the same for the grayling which is also declining but I just just like to finish on that so hopefully there's some um, future 
future funding for this project and anybody that wants to get interested you can let us know give us an email or something okay. i think that is just the summary for anybody to have a read of and then that that's over to questions if anybody has any awesome thank you for that jen and um, we're a little bit tight on time we have got yeah quite a i know <laughs> i went over a bit <laughs> oh, don't don't worry i do that every time um, it's a very interesting talk anyway so i'm quite happy that you did um, what we'll do though is if anyone does have a burning question and wants to ask it in person, they can raise yeah. their hands. Um, but whilst we're waiting for anyone to do that, I'll just ask a couple that we've we've had yeah, uh, in okay. the chat. Yeah. Um, so we had a, a um, question from Louise who's asked, is bracken detrimental to bilberry conservation? Um, so I'm not specifically sure to bilberry conservation. So is that for the plant or for the bumblebees? Just so I'm making sure I'm answering it right. I think I think to both really both okay um so I know bracken does where it grows it does sort of kill anything else off because it releases the, all of the metabolites and makes the soil a bit more acidic so I'm not sure of the exact scale of the response but because bilberries do grow on more acidic landscapes and soils they might be slightly less effective but I'm, I can have a look into that for you I'm not 100% sure at the moment Awesome. Yeah. Okay. We can have a look into yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. If you sent me an email, um, or just reply to reply to Aaron, then that will be fine. I can have a have a go finding an answer for you. Awesome. Um. So we have a question. Um. Do you use cameras to monitor bees? So like um. I mean like camera traps sort of. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um. Or or take. I think that might have been in reference to. Or just taking photos. Taking photos for ID. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yes, that's that is the preferred if you're able to get a picture, or maybe if not, if you can make a quick sketch, that's also useful. Just the bumblebees, they are they are a bit variable, but normally if you can match up the bands on on the bee with colour and how many there are, there's quite a good tool on the Bumblebee Conservation Trust website, which I think if you click through, it says and identify the this bumblebee and you can click through and say um this is the main tail color then it will take you to um through a couple of steps and it will suggest what what might be the bee that you found which it takes a bit of the stress out of it if, if you're not too sure yeah and that's the great thing about the bilby bumblebee isn't it that you can you can yes, take photographs of it, and... it is, yes and it is the only one that's got that much red so once yeah. once you know what you're looking for it should be relatively easy to uh, rule out the other species. Yeah, uh, we have a really great question from Hannah and she said, I am bee obsessed. I have contacted <laughs> the Bumblebee Conservation Trust about conservation yeah. and volunteering. How can I get into volunteering in regards to helping bees, please? Oh, that's a good question. I'm, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out myself. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of places will have a, like a local nature and wildlife groups. So those are always a good, a good start because you can join those and see if there's, if there's anybody that's interested in in the same thing as you or another another good way is specifically for bumblebees at least you can you could maybe see if there's somebody that runs a bee walk or a bee bio blitz near you or set up your own one which you basically walk for i think it's about a kilometer transect length and then just note down whilst you're walking slowly which bumblebee species there are and what kind of habitats you're walking through I've mostly just done mine independent or on field courses where I just go out when it's some nice weather, take some pictures and just get into it doing some um, bio recording, which is that's always a nice um, pastime as well. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. And I, and I just second that as well. Uh, yeah. Volunteering is is yes. really helpful, yeah. giving you the employability skills and, and the networking skills. But mm -hmm. yeah, like Jen said, going out and recording, yes. getting up There's close. There's lo lots of different ways. <laughs> sure there's not one Absolutely. set way you can probably do it and yeah various if, if you need more specific information about that if you just drop us an email at biolinks at phil studies council we can forward you on to some some cool opportunities um i've got a question from graham here uh, why may it be that the bilberry bumblebee particularly like to use the legumes as a backup slash alternative to keep them full and happy that's that was a good question i think with a lot of bumblebees it's about there's short tongue species and longer tongue species. And because legumes, they have the, 
hard to <laughs> hard to explain it without using all the proper technical terms but um the sort of the length of the, uh, the flower tends to be a bit longer in legumes so I imagine but I'm not too sure that bilberry bumblebees should have a longer tongue so they can reach right to collect the nectar but there are there are a couple of bumblebee species which do nectar rub so they will like sort of bite a hole closer to the nectar and just bypass the whole pollination process but I think bilberry bumblebees probably have got a bit of a longer tongue so they can they can reach into that and legumes have they have quite protein rich pollen so that that is another benefit I think of using using the legumes they keep keeps them full for a bit longer yeah we love legumes too for the same reason don't they yeah um, <laughs> full of protein and um, we have a question from Tony he's asked do you know about the status of bilberry bumblebees in Scotland are the populations increasing or decreasing that's a good one um I'm not too sure about that I don't know if anybody else on on the call can contribute <laughs> anything to that but I know that I imagine they will probably be doing at least stable or more abundant in Scotland, just because if that you've got that big, um, let me see if I can find this slide again, when you had the map, um, where is it? Oh, there it is. So um, this map, you can see like all of this dark a bit, I think is uh, more the more recent records. So this obviously will be the, the um, highlands where you've got a lot less um, human disturbance and things. So there's, in theory, they should be doing better. But obviously that depends on the climate change and the, the local situations. But um, you might be able to get in contact with um, some of the, the Scottish recording, recording societies because they probably will have a bit more information specific to, to those areas. Awesome, thank you, Jen. Um, we have a question that's more about this is more of a general bumblebee question. Um, yep. so this one's from Louise and it says, Are are what are the workers sterile from the beginning of their development or do they become so during? Yeah, that's really that's a really good question. So they are they hatch out um and develop sterile, so they're always sterile, but um some in some cases they can lay eggs which can develop into into bees but normally how it works and this is the same with um, ants as well is that the queens produce a pheromone which is just a chemical that will control the behavior of the rest of their colony so it kind of keeps them not reproducing and it keeps them looking after the colony rather than putting energy into making offspring and if they do ever get a chance to either mate or lay an egg, normally the queen will notice and she'll um, destroy their eggs so that it's only her offspring that will produce adults. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how it is in um, in bumblebees, but I know in some solitary bee yeah. species they have. So you have like eusocial solitary bee species, which are solitary bees, but they have some primitive forms of social behaviour. And uh, like you said, they release a, the queen. Mm -hmm releases a pheromone that suppresses just, yeah suppress, the that was the word I was trying to think of yeah. <laughs> the, the ovary development of the workers yeah, exactly. um, and so she she's the only reproductively active yes. member of that colony that would be quite similar to that in bumblebees I believe not quite yeah. sure of the specifics but it's, it's along along that sort of reasoning yeah awesome I think that's that's it for questions I'm just yeah. going to stop the recording now okay